Hi everyone, my name is Evelyn Pless. I'm a PhD student in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Yale University. This is my second talk in a two-part series, and in the first talk I went over the fundamentals of invasive species and disease vectors. Today I'm going to dive into mosquitoes, the diseases they carry and the places they invade, with a focus on some of my own research in this field. So mosquitoes and humans have a long history together. In ancient Rome, uh, malaria, which we now know is carried by a mosquito, was so prevalent that people prayed to a god called Phoebus to protect them from uh, this disease. And uh, physicians at the time had a different suggestion. They said you should wear a pendant around your neck that said abracadabra like this to protect you. And uh, as a Harry Potter fan, I can't help but mentioning that the word abracadabra inspired the killing curse of Vada Kedavra. So we've got a direct link from mosquitoes to the most dangerous uh, spell in Harry Potter. And uh, indeed, mosquitoes really are uh, a, a dangerous uh, group of animals. Uh, more than half of the global population is at risk of infection with a mosquito-borne disease. And uh, billions of people throughout time have died of malaria. Some people think that maybe half of all people who ever lived died of malaria, but that's pretty hard to prove. So in my talk today, I'm going to give you an introduction to mosquitoes and then go over which mosquitoes are most dangerous and what diseases do they carry. And finally, how can we study the spread of an invasive mosquito using history and genetics? So mosquitoes are in the order Diptera with other flies and the family Culicidae. They likely originated during the Jurassic. And kind of like the Jurassic Park movie, there are early mosquito uh, fossils preserved in amber. Uh, during their lifetime, mosquitoes go from egg to larvae to pupae to adult. And um, as an adult, only one of the sexes uh, needs uh, uh, blood meals. And if you guessed females, you're correct. The females generally need blood in order to develop their eggs. The males just reproduce and they generally don't live as long, they're smaller and sometimes they pollinate flowers. We've also got a lot of diversity within mosquitoes as a group. There are more than 3,500 species, and uh, only a couple dozen of those are important uh, disease vectors. We've got our everything from the boring brown Culex to the regal Aedes albopictus, also known as the tiger mosquito, uh, to the really big, gangly elephant mosquito, also known as uh, Toxorhynchites. Uh, and there's also diversity in how they lay eggs. Some lay eggs in a raft like this, on in marshes or wetlands or standing bodies of water in your backyard. And um, one is really uh, domesticated and it lays eggs like this in human-made containers, such as uh, used tires. So let's look into which mosquitoes are most dangerous and what diseases do they carry. The two most dangerous groups of mosquitoes are Anopheles, especially the, speci the species Anopheles gambiae, and Aedes, especially the species Aedes aegypti. So as you can tell from their common name, uh, the Anopheles group carries malaria, uh, which is a microorganism parasite that infects red blood cells. Um, it's a huge issue and causes about 500,000 deaths a year, mostly in Africa. Uh, fortunately, there has been some improvement um, with prevention and treatment this decade. On the other hand, the uh, diseases carried by Aedes, um, and especially Aedes aegypti, have been on the rise in that time. So you can recognize Aedes aegypti by this nice lyre shape on its thorax. It's uh, very invasive. This is the one that lays those eggs in like tires and human-made containers, and that's that allows them to spread really easily with uh, humans on our transportation networks. They're also anthrophilic, meaning human loving, so they prefer to bite people. And that makes them really powerful vectors for the diseases they carry, dengue, zika, chikungunya, and yellow fever. So dengue is the one that, that um, our lab worries about a lot. This is really widespread around the world, and it's increased 30-fold in the last 50 years. Zika is a closely related virus. Um, it got a lot of attention in the 2015-2016 outbreak um, in the Americas and especially in Brazil um, due to its really sad um, association with microcephaly. Chikungunya is another unpleasant uh, virus. 
um, and it got suppressed too in the 2014 outbreak in the Americas. And then finally, yellow fever. Of the four diseases, this is by far the most terrible um, and most deadly, but fortunately there is an effective vaccine. Um, so it's very historically important, although unfortunately there are some recent outbreaks in South America and um, Africa. So now we can look at uh, Aedes aegypti more closely um, and uh, look at how to study the spread of this invasive uh, mosquito using history and genetics. So for a couple of reasons, we know that Aedes aegypti started in Africa. And um, one way to study how it first moved out of Africa is to look at historical records of yellow fever. And we can do this because yellow fever um, has distinct symptoms, including uh, a black vomit. So the um, first cases of yellow fever in the Americas were in the 1640s in the Caribbean, and that was followed by some really bad outbreaks along the east coast of North America. Then in the 1700s, there were cases of yellow fever in Europe. And if we think about uh, what was happening at this time in history, uh, this is around the same time, or this is at the same time as the Atlantic slave trade. So this is what first brought uh, Aedes aegypti and six sailors and six slaves to other parts of the world. Since then, of course, there's been a lot more globalization and trade, and Aedes aegypti has spread pretty widely around the world, as you can see in this map. Also, as the climate warms, they're able to move into more temperate regions. And as an example of this, we can look at the United States. Um, in the last decade, there have been um, a, a big handful of places that first detected Aedes aegypti um, in this time. And I've uh, studied some of these personally, and I'm gonna uh, talk about California uh, next, uh, my, my home state. So Aedes aegypti was first detected in California in Madeira in 2013. And um, folks were worried at the time, maybe was it coming up from Mexico where, where there is some dengue? And then two years later, this was during a really bad drought, they detected the mosquito in Southern California and they worried maybe it was um, coming down from Northern, uh, Northern California in contaminated water. Uh, there was also um, uncertainty about whether it was surviving over winter in California, even though it freezes occasionally, which Aedes aegypti doesn't like. Um, and then it spread really quickly, as you can see, it's, it's covered a lot of the state now. It's also important to know where these new invasions came from because you want to know if the mosquitoes are coming from somewhere with disease. And also different regions vary in the mosquitoes' uh, level of vector competence, which means how well they transmit disease, and pesticide resistance, which is a genetic adaptation that mosquitoes can evolve. Luckily, we don't have uh, yellow fever prevalent in the United States to, uh, uh, tr to sort of study the spread of Aedes aegypti. So we have to find a new tool. And my lab uh, proposes to use DNA. And uh, the reason that we can do this is that mosquitoes from different regions have unique genetic fingerprints. Uh, you can think of this a little bit like 23andMe, but for mosquitoes. So in my study, I used uh, populations from all the places indicated in this map, um, about 30 to 50 individuals from each. Um, in a couple of cases, I went out to the field to collect the mosquitoes, but in most cases, we have great collaborators who sent us mosquitoes. And uh, the next step is I to identify the Aedes aegypti. And then I did a lot of lab work, which um, involves grinding up the mosquitoes, extracting their DNA, and then using molecular methods to read the DNA at known variable regions, which we call genetic markers. So as you know, we all have DNA, and it's kind of like the blueprint of our body. And within a species, there are a lot of spots in the DNA that are the same across um, all, all individuals, but there are some spots that are different. And so those are important for us for, for these sorts of analyses. Uh, one type of genetic marker is called a single nucleotide polymorphism, or a SNP, and that's when individuals vary at one specific location in the genome. So for example, the red population of mosquitoes generally has an A at that third position, whereas the blue population generally has a T. Another type of genetic marker that we used uh, is called a microsatellite. And um, this is where different individuals have a different number of repeats um, of, this, of this DNA. So in total, we use 12 microsatellites and more than 15,000 SNPs in this analysis. The next step was to do population genetics analyses. Uh, these are sort of sophisticated statistical 
uh, analyses that we can run on the computer. One that I want to highlight is called a structure plot, and this one's really important. Um, so each individual is represented by a vertical bar, and the color of that bar represents what proportion of its ancestry comes from what, uh, each ancestral group. So individual one is from the red group, individual two from the blue group, and individual three is a mixture of those two ancestral groups. So when we look at a structure plot for the United States and North America, Starting just with California, we see two really clear ancestral groups emerge. And then when we look at this in terms of the rest of the country, we see that Northern California is most closely related to Southern, uh, South Central and Southeast United States, whereas Southern California is more closely related to Southwest. So this analysis and a few others led us to this prediction that there were at least two invasions into California which is represented by uh, the, the diagram on the left, which is you can think of a little bit like a family tree. And so um, another way to test this prediction is to use computer simulations. So we had that prediction plus a number of alternative options, and then we had the computer use those predictions to make uh, big simulated data sets. And then we compared each of those simulated data to uh, the real data to see which matched most closely. And the program uh, agreed that our prediction was the most likely scenario. Uh, then we added in Las Vegas and did some similar analyses. And um, those showed that the Las Vegas population is most likely from uh, the Los Angeles or Orange County region, uh, which I think makes sense because there's a, a busy highway that connects the two. So in conclusion, we've got at least two uh, invasions into California, followed by the invasion into Las Vegas. We also uh, found evidence that mosquitoes are able to survive the winter in Northern California, despite some occasional freezing temperatures. In conclusion, uh, we have gone over what mosquitoes are, what their effect on public health is, and how to use history and population genetics to study the invasions of Aedes aegypti. Uh, thank you to my advisor and my lab mates and, and uh, everyone else who has helped me with this research. Uh, I've provided some sources here if you want to learn more about this work. Uh, thank you to you for your attention and feel free to be in touch if you want to learn more about this.